But I don't, I really don't have any regrets. I really don't. I've, I've lived exactly how I've wanted to. I've tried my hardest every single time. I didn't win the matches that maybe I should have always won. Or, but I really gave it my all. So that for me is enough. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to The Body Serve. I'm Jonathan. And I'm James. For episode 192, we have one overarching theme, and it is the title of our episode, Stay the Fuck at Home. Just get right to the point right away. If you can, if you're not an essential worker, if you are able to stay inside, please do so, because it'll make those essential workers safer. It'll make us all safer. Social distancing is already working. In a lot of places, this shit is still spreading, but it could be a whole lot worse in Canada had we not instituted this policy. I get the impulse to be, people call it panic buying, but I think of it more as worst case scenario buying, where you may have enough at home to get you through like even a week or two, but you always have in the back of your mind, well, I don't want to be caught out, you know, because you don't really know exactly what's to come. Mm -hmm. But really, minimize that stuff as much as you can. I would recommend, if you can, again, online ordering your groceries, where some places you can just go pull your car up and they'll load your trunk and off you go. Some places are still delivering. Whatever you can do to, to limit the corona footprint, we advise and we thank you. To that end, the USTA today opined on the current state of corona and tennis, issuing a statement on the safety of playing tennis during the COVID-19 virus pandemic. It states, The COVID-19 pandemic is creating challenges for everyone across the globe. American tennis players are asking for guidance regarding the safety of playing tennis, especially when social distancing and space sharing issues are now paramount. Based on the recommendations of the USTA COVID-19 advisory group, The USTA believes that it is in the best interest of society to take a collective pause from playing the sport we love. Although there are no specific studies on tennis and COVID-19, medical advisors believe there is the possibility that the virus responsible for COVID-19 could be transmitted through common sharing and handling of tennis balls, gate handles, benches, net posts, and even court surfaces. As a result of this, The USTA asks that as tennis players, we need to be patient in our return to the courts and consider how our decisions will not only affect ourselves, but how our decisions can impact our broader communities. In the meantime, we encourage everyone to stay active and healthy with at-home exercise and creative tennis at home variations. We look forward to our return to tennis in a safe manner and will provide updates as new information becomes available. By practicing all the recommended guidelines presently put forth by our medical experts, that return will happen in the soonest possible time frame. It needed to happen. That's great. Tennis needs to stop. It sucks, but it's the reality. Earlier this week, a Tennis Channel commentator posted a video with two older gentlemen playing tennis, and the commentator sort of mock commentated their match while on court with them. All of the replies were like, oh my god, this is great. And I'm like, what is not clicking, guys? Like, do you not realize this is not a joke? Go home. Get off the tennis court. Not only that, a lot of the things that we know or think we know about this virus is still speculation. And there's still stuff about the way it's transmitted that it's still unclear. And so while we may think it's okay to be just outside super social distancing away from folks you who knows what the air that you're breathing in contains you know like this is still an ever-evolving issue and so to err on the side of extreme caution is the way to go so the tennis world continues to adapt and and change policies cancel events so much is uncertain right now but what was not shocking at all was that wimbledon officially canceled itself this year but they made the announcement this week and i kind of i had thought they already announced it so wimbledon is not postponed it's not put on hold it is canceled in 2020 it will not be held later in the year because of the climate and the grass and so many other considerations it's just not a possibility for a tournament like wimbledon 
to you know plan for an October start, for example, or mid-September, whatever. Shortly after, the ATP and the WTA pushed back their suspension till at least July 13th. The US Open and Roland Garros and Labor Cup, some of which overlap, are still officially on, but uh, I don't think there's going to be any tennis this year at all. I really we'll get to don't. that. You're jumping the gun. Oh, okay. That literally is a question on the agenda a few paragraphs down. <laughs> you repeatedly have this problem. <laughs> sure, it's not exactly a spoiler. Like, we're not telling a story here. Lord. Um, there were a lot of player reactions to the cancellation, obviously. Serena Williams tweeted, I'm shooked. Shooked? How does one pronounce that? Is there an accent over the E like in Shakespeare? The common parlance currently is shooketh or shook. <laughs> yeah. This iteration is not one that I've seen before. Or I'm shocked. Was or it a typo shake, of shocked? shaken? Shaken? It could be a new invention. You, listen, you're mm-hmm. somebody who always says that being a stickler for grammar is archaic and just really being bad-minded people because language conveys meaning and if you receive that meaning, then like, what's the big deal? Did you receive her meaning? I did. Serena Williams continues to blaze new paths in in all places, language being one of them. She invented a new word, or at least a new spelling for a word that already exists, which would not be the first time. An interesting tidbit from this Wimbledon cancellation is the fact that unlike, well, the French Open and the US Open, should they not happen, Wimbledon will be able to recoup more money or most of their money that they would have lost via insurance because in their insurance policy, they have a pandemic clause. They have pandemic insurance. Really? Which folks will now be looking to obtain in future well, years. good luck with that now. But whoever came up with that idea was ahead of the curve. Right. I don't, I don't know much about insurance, but is it, it's covered under like their act of God or like force majeure policy or something? Like they've made provision for this possibility. So you didn't know much about this and you thought I would know oh, more I'm... about this? <laughs> that I would know more about insurance? Well, There was listen. an article that was uh, paywalled. The actual article oh, okay. that, that dealt with that, I mm-hmm. could not access it. In, in, I accessed a more general description of what had happened. In this economy, paywalling stories that have to do with corona? Mm-mm, don't do it. Other former champions chimed in about the cancellation who, of Wimbledon. Who are the other champions prior to this that you were talking You said other former champions. Well, Serena. Okay. So Serena said, I'm shooked. Shooked. Okay. That was a bit unclear. Um, Martina Hingis decided to, I mean, make it about herself. Hers wasn't necessarily with respect to Wimbledon specifically, was it? Was it something about a birthday or... It's it, it's a little bit different. I just pulled it up. This is from three days ago. Martina tweets, 23 years ago today, I became the youngest tennis player to become number one in the world. In these challenging times, though, it is hard to enjoy it. I can only reflect on how many people are suffering. We need to stay strong. We are all in this together. Hashtag alone together. Accompanied by a photograph of her kissing the Daphne Ackhurst trophy in one picture. And then another of her looking joyously, longingly off into the distance. Presumably the crowd of a tennis match. I I don't know, it's... She's looking real happy in both pictures. Yeah, so, okay, fine. This wasn't about the Wimbledon cancellation. This was, I know people are suffering, but but let's celebrate me for a minute, okay? Like, why would I not celebrate the 23-year anniversary of me becoming the youngest number one? Fuck a pandemic. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to sit at home and not tweet about it. Like, like are y'all mad? Right. Like, why should I be deprived of that? <laughs> we can still have joy in our lives. To be to be clear, we are poking fun. Like it's not that serious. It's on not the list of serious things. It's that not. Are but Martina also has a history of tweeting people things, congratulating them with a picture of herself. Yes, in it. it's. I mean, you gotta love the narcissist energy. It is consistent. It is on brand. Uh, a few other former champs tweeted their championship photo. Simona Halep, Angelique Kerber. I mean, 
just be careful. Be ca I'm telling you my my advice. Just be careful about criticizing Simona Halep out here on these Twitter streets. And I will say to you, you are being disingenuous because you are not new. Mm -mm. You knew what you were doing. Mm -hmm. You are deliberately provocative. Yes, sir. Anybody who read those tweets would have seen what was to come. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to sit here and play the victim. No, I was trolling on purpose. Thank I'm you. Not, I'm not the Thank victim, you. Okay, honey. Okay, I'm just saying you presented it in a certain kind of way. No, I had a little fun and it gave me pleasure. And it gave me even more pleasure to call them attention-seeking just like their fave. <laughs> And did it also give you pleasure to block? Yes. It's one thing it when always, somebody... It always does. It's one thing when somebody comes for you unprovoked and you have to block them. Mm. But to instigate but, and then get mad but and then I block. I didn't come for... I didn't even identify whom I was speaking about. We just... It's called guilty conscience. No, no, no. Somebody like, why are, you, why are you coming at me unless you feel that you have something to answer for? But, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't identify who I was talking about. Oh, that is not true. <laughs> uh, uh, somebody responded to you and like, who are we talking about? And you're like, well, it's this person with like two letters asterisked. Yeah. So like, I st we know who you're talking was, about. One. It was the Enigma code. And also, secondly, we just had a segment last week reflecting on, what was it? F fandom as... Fetish. Fetish. A fetish Fan object. Yes. Exactly. So we know how irrational being a fan is. Mm -hmm. So if you are a huge Simona fan, if you're a huge Maria fan, if you're a huge Serena fan, mm -hmm. there are certain folks within those groups who may not be able to to see through your bullshit mm -hmm. and just let it be. You know, this is right. a, we bring this to the table. Yeah, you know, we are allowed a small measure of fun during <laughs> the social distancing. A little bit. I agree. That's fun for I me. agree. But you don't get to then be victim. I wasn't... As much as you say you're not trying to be victim. I was not trying to play the victim at all. Mm. Okay. Back to more serious subjects. Both Wimbledon and the US Open are offering its facilities up for support. And uh, uh, in some cases accommodating people afflicted with COVID-19. Billie Jean King tweeted today a photo of Louis Armstrong Stadium. We learned a few days ago that the Billie Jean King National Tennis Center was going to become uh, a center for supporting New York City in the coronavirus crisis. And Louis Armstrong Stadium is now a food prep and distribution center where people are packaging up, uh, according to Billie Jean, 25,000 food packages daily, each with two days worth of meals for patients, workers, and kids. Other parts of the center will become a hospital because New York City is so incredibly overloaded at the moment. You know, I feel a few things looking at this. When the news came out, the for me, the initial emotion was just really just stunned sadness that these facilities are having to be used for this crisis, that the New York City hospital system is already so overwhelmed. Um, and then... You know, a small measure of pride that, that tennis can at least give something. Mm -hmm. And also, for me, a sense of common sense prevailing. Because how much of the year is the Billie Jean National Tennis Center occupied mm -hmm. to capacity to be using all of its facilities? How many places in a dense city like New York could offer that kind of service? Right. And now that... You know, recreational tennis is not happening at the BJK National Tennis Center. Concerts are not happening. All public events are canceled. Why not? You know, why not seek out every available public space? Especially in the United States where everything is so fragmented, where the response and the call to action and help is not always being met by corporate entities and people who mm. have a lot of resources. This was refreshing to see. Because we had just seen, uh, where was it, Philadelphia? Some city where a hospital had been abandoned. It was no longer mm -hmm. in use. And the governor was calling on that facility to be used to assist. Yes, this private facility, <laughs> exactly. basically. That's a, that it's not being used. It's abandoned. Mm -hmm. It's shuttered. And the city could not reach an agreement with the 
billionaire owner who wanted to charge something like a hundred million dollars a month or some ridiculous mm. fee. So for yeah. this, so this is where we're at. Exactly. Right? We have governors who don't know how the disease is transmitted, who can't even bother reading the press releases. That same governor. We have some great governors who are acting like presidents. We have other governors who aren't doing shit. Like, I guess you're just shit out of luck if you live in one of those states. We have governors who might not be shit outside of COVID, but have risen to the occasion. <laughs> right. Even in Toronto or Premier or in Terran oh Premier, Doug Ford has risen to the challenge. Right. More so than I would have expected, oh, at way, least. Way more so. And when I think of his stock and where he comes from and his family and how I associated him mm -hmm. with Trump, not even thinking twice yeah. about it, listening to both of them on the public airwaves is, it's as stark a difference as you can get. And I am, for one, although I never thought I would say it, very thankful. It's a very weird place to be in, to yeah. feel confidence in Doug Ford, who you may not know about Toronto's recent history, but he is Rob Ford's brother. Rob Ford is our late mayor who was implicated in that uh, crack smoking video with gang members. Not dissimilar to uh, Marion Barry in Washington, D.C., but Doug was a city councillor and became the premier uh, last year, I think, and run on a very right-wing platform and realized that didn't really fly in Ontario after he became the premier of the province. And especially after our last federal election. Yes. So. Anyway, but we also have that same governor from Georgia that you were talking about, who, when he was attorney general, stole that governorship election from Stacey Abrams. Yes. Full on stole Removed it. literally millions of people from the rolls. And so now <laughs> that he is called to lead and do what governors should do, the cupboard is empty. Mm -hmm. Same situation in Florida. DeSantis really doesn't know his head from his ass. So the uh, point here is we are glad that tennis can help make a horrible situation even a little bit better. Mm hmm Okay, so back to tennis. What are the chances that we see any tennis being played in 2020? This is the question that you jumped the gun on. It is. See, it's, it's, it's right there. So what's your feeling? The answer is zero chance for me. Yeah. And mind yeah. you, this is, this is less than a month from not even really thinking about this in terms of tennis. Less than a month from the cancellation of Indian Wells. And we're now, I think, at more of a consensus, not just you and I, but we've seen it a lot of places elsewhere, that tennis is just not going to happen in 2020. Mm -hmm. How rapidly this has all developed is, it's hard to really comprehend. It is. And it's, you know, it's something that most of us have not seen in our lifetime. We've not lived through a world war. If you live in the United States or Canada or Britain, you have been you know, largely free of war in your homeland since the Second World War. Americans started wars other places. But we we have lived a very peaceful, very privileged lives for our entire life. Um, I mean, I'm speaking as an American. Mm -hmm. You're from Jamaica. But for a lot of people, this is really the first the first true hardship that they're having to go through. And we're going through it as a collective. And uh, there have been emotional collective hardships before, the most notable being 9-11. Yeah, yeah. It was a tragic thing for so many who were directly affected, but we'll see now that this is something on an exponentially larger scale to the point where they'll, there'll likely be not one person in America who doesn't know somebody who was affected by it, mm. if not themselves. Right. And of course, we all experience it differently based on where we are in society and we have unequal experiences and some people will face worse hardships than others for many different reasons. Um, some of us have the privilege to avoid a lot of those hardships. But uh, I like the point of me saying this is that you can't blame anyone for not, not being able to predict what comes next vis-a-vis -vis the tennis season, right? That's what this podcast is about. We're a tennis podcast we were just talking about Indian Wells canceling less than a day before the tournament was supposed to start. 
at the time we were still wondering if Miami goes on, should we go? Like, is it safe to go? It yeah. became eminently clear that it was not safe to go. We were still wondering about Berlin at the end of June. That is obviously a no-go now. The entire grass circuit is canceled. That became obvious, but it wasn't obvious for weeks. And now... Well, I mean, there have only been three weeks. <laughs> right. Well, really. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, where I work, it wasn't even clear. People were asking, you know, do you think uh, certain people should work from home? Do you think that pregnant women should be able to work from home? And I'm like, give it two days and we might all be working from home. And then, voila, there's no choice. It's happened very quickly. And so I think this is so serious and the United States is not so far doing an amazing job at flattening the curve that like we could be here for a while, unfortunately. That was a very soft approach. Yeah, I mean, just I don't want to make people feel worse about it. Like, uh, we're not we're not medical experts. We're not here to lecture you. I'm just saying, like, I don't I don't see tennis happening this year, and I don't even think it would be responsible for tennis to start up. No, I agree, but I'm talking mm-hmm. about the way you described the way the U.S. is handling yeah. it. Because yeah. for me, it is it is something that needs to have all the alarm bells ringing. Mm. And I'll explain that as it relates to tennis in two ways. The first being, you have these 50 United States that outside of Hawaii, they're all connected by land. Mm -hmm. And so you have all these different governors being being forced to be solely responsible for what happens within their states. But those decisions have an effect on all the other states. Right. Because if New York, which is going through this just calamitous situation gets through the other side in a couple months what's the plan of action with planes flying into new york with people crossing into new york by car Mm -hmm. bringing the virus from other states that haven't taken as hands-on or proactive approach to this right and so you i foresee a situation where and i hate to say it, it it seems to be falling along partisan lines here, blue or red state handling of of the pandemic, where one state gets its stuff in order and then the other just reinfects. Like I'm thinking of a worst case scenario. If you've been to the United States, like you don't need a passport to go from New York to Pennsylvania to Ohio to... You need a a driver's license to get on a plane. Like state boundaries are imaginary, right? Like you can drive to state to state. There's no border crossing. There's no guard stopping you. You can you can walk across the borders. So the idea that each state and in some places each county should have its own policy is like it doesn't work. It may work for education and for healthcare, but it doesn't work to divide a pandemic response up between these municipalities or states. No. And so as long as there isn't a unified federal response to this pandemic, the U.S. is going to be isolated from the rest of the world. Yeah, yeah. And if we are taking the approach, and I've seen this from the start of this pandemic, where folks in the United States have been saying, well, we'll put Indian wells at this point. We'll do it when the Asian swing is supposed to be going on. And I always thought to myself, look, well, these Asian nation states are taking this seriously. And so they're going to be most equipped by the end of the year to be hosting tennis but at that time which country in their right mind will be having americans flying into their country i don't want americans driving into canada the thing is if there are nations that have travel restrictions i don't think you can hold an international tennis tournament like it's certainly not fair but my point is it was always framed in that that way that what if these foreign countries aren't able to do this. Mm, what, right. if these foreign players aren't able to go there. When in fact, it's y'all who are going to be having this like long-term problem. And this yeah. is not just me sitting here. I'm taking no pleasure in this at all. Mm. I don't want that to come across. But I want us to get a real perspective here that tennis being so global, it requires that the virus be completely under control uniformly for tennis to move forward. Yeah. I mean, and I don't see a way for that to happen by the end of the year. A gathering of 20,000, 30,000 people at a tennis tournament like that is that's just a petri dish, right? Un- unless we have some serious treatment by then. We saw what happened in the north of Italy. They've mm. tracked it back to these large events. Yeah. All right. So what are the implications of canceling tennis for an entire season? 
Not great, Bob. Not gr- no, not great. Not great. A, a lot of you will probably be thinking about what is the impact on players, on your favorite players, on players who might have been planning to retire after the Olympics or the U.S. Open. Uh, we got 39-year-olds out here. Right? Soon to be 40-year-olds <laughs> right? in a couple months. I they're, Obviously, we have no idea what they're thinking, and they probably don't know what they're thinking yet. But people like Venus, Roger, Serena, if Serena wants to have another baby, who knows? Well, how? What impact will this have on the future of their careers? We don't know. I think there are a few ways to look at it. You can say, well, maybe they don't want to be taken out like this. Maybe they don't want this horrible crisis to end their careers and they're going to be motivated in 2021 for one last run, for one last Olympics. On the other hand, what if it's like, I can't, uh, basically, I can't afford to lose another year and I, I gotta stop, right? Like, I just don't think they know yet. I will say this, Venus and Serena don't look too concerned <laughs> at the moment based on their social media right. output. And I think it puts into perspective that for them, time is a construct <laughs> and time is something that is most pressing to everybody but them. Yes. Because they make their own time to do what they want. The time is a flat circle. A time is Jeremy Baramy from The Good Place. <laughs> it is... Uh, it makes no linear sense to the Williams, including Oracine. Look at her. 68 years old today and out here doing Venus's workout. <laughs> but some of the older players who have been nursing these long-standing injuries, this may actually give them a chance to recover a little bit physically. To just do some regular old conditioning in the gym and not hit tennis balls for a little while. And if, let's say, Venus has been dealing with these injuries for years now, will a year off help her? It's possible. Will there be folks who maybe they weren't talking or thinking about retirement privately, and then they have this year off Mm -hmm. for all intents and purposes, and they struggle emotionally and physically to get back into it, and they're like, this is... This is it for me. Right. Because there's also the the element of, fine, Tamani Carroll came out with a piece today about Ons Jabour, who was having a breakout season so far, and it's completely halted. Mm. What if she's not able to recapture that, that magic? Right. In a year from now, or in eight months from now. Hitting, the same could hitting be, against a wall. The same could be for a top 10 player, or a top 20 player. You never know. Like, this type of layoff... It's not a given that you'll be able to come back at the level that you were before. Mm -hmm. Something like this can take a toll on one's mental health a lot. You know, you don't know what these players are going through. If, God forbid, they lose somebody during this year. And for some players, maybe they'll find that they can't afford to come back to the sport. You know, a lot of them, as youngsters, take out so many loans from so, so many different people. Their prize money is supposed to pay those loans back. What if they can't afford or nobody will give them the capital to start their career again? That's a, a real possibility. And you'll see this in many, many industries. Or the fact that their their previous investors don't have that capital. It's not just, right. oh, we don't want to invest in you. We, we really just cannot. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, of course, in many ways, the players are among the most privileged in the sport. Officials, chair umpires, lines people will not be getting paid because they're not working. People who work, I mean, think about the people who work in the stadium, seasonal workers, custodians, um, you know, the the staff of the leagues, of the tournaments. If, if the work is not happening, a lot of people are not getting paid. So there are massive implications for the sport and people working in the sport. Some federations with a lot of capital are trying to help those folks. But A lot of these leagues and and these associations simply cannot afford it. So this leads to this next bit where we're wondering where can we get money to help these folks in tennis who are affected by the lack of tournament play, be it players, be it coaches, umpires, etc. And one player who is kind of leading the charge in this regard is Georgian player Sofia Shapatova, who started a... What is it? A, a, a change.org petition. Yes. And uh, she's trying to get, I believe, 2,500 signatures. And her her plea is, professional tennis players all over the world stop to compete. 
whilst top athletes have resources to support themselves for a couple of months, lower ranked players suffer a lot. Not many will be able to support their everyday life and then come back to playing after three months without competition. The companies in charge of the tennis circuit should help to secure players, or at least help them through this hard time for a sport. Any help will do for the majority. Many companies organized paid leave to their employees and tennis players are also employees of the world's tennis organizations. I do believe they should get some support as well as we pay taxes, we pay licenses, and we are working for them. The total shutdown was very unexpected and the majority is very affected by this. Though it is a hard time for everyone, there has to be support and help also for everyone. Right. This is a lot. She has pointed out some stark realities for this sport that existed before this crisis and will endure throughout this crisis that a lot of players ranked outside the top 100 are barely getting by, are barely making ends meet. Her frustration is extremely real and serious, but I do kind of wonder, like, who is in the position to to help, mm-hmm. you know? So I don't... I don't know where where this is targeted. Like if it's toward the WTA, the ITF, sponsors, tournaments, whatever. Like she is just screaming into the void saying like, tennis players need help. We are not making any income through this period. And that's the case for a lot of workers. There's this myth that tennis players make a lot of money. If you follow tennis closely, you know that it's it's a, a certain few, a select few that would be able to withstand a year of not getting any income from tennis. There are top 50 players who do not have clothing sponsors. It also, in thinking about this, gets us to really focus on just how disparate the tennis superstructure is, in that there are so many different competing interests that look out for themselves when business is happening in normal times. Mm -hmm. And we saw that in this pandemic with the French Open. Roland Garros said, fuck all y'all, I'm going to do me. Right. I'm going to secure this spot at the end of the year and make sure that we can make this money. Right? They, they made sure they were first, right? They sit on a Grand Slam board with three other Grand Slams, but these interests are driven from television contracts, from the national federations who actually operate the Grand Slam term- tournaments, the president of the national federations. In that case, it was Bernard Giudicelli, who was the French Federation president. There are so many vested interests. And why it's particularly selfish of the French Federation to make that decision is because they are one of four governing bodies in tennis that can most afford to withstand this financial hit. And instead of working with others to see how we can help each other, how we can help the players, how we can help the coaches, how we can come out on the other side of this better together. They've looked after themselves first. And in doing so, while Labor Cup isn't one to really look at in this regard, they're affected by it based on where they've picked in the schedule. Mm -hmm. But there are smaller tournaments that are then put out by this decision. Oh, right. And those are the ones who are really in peril potentially struggling to survive even into next year if they're not able to a host a tournament or b host it in a much more depleted way Mm -hmm. yeah so you wonder like what the tournament schedule is going to look like a year out from this which tournaments will survive a year without any revenue and which won't which sponsors will be able or willing to sponsor those tournaments it's a it's a lot and so tennis players are stuck in the middle here they're the they're the labor they're the talent and sophia in her petition identified players as employees and that may be what she feels and believes but players are not technically employees of the wta or atp they're independent contractors or the itf right or their home you know like- uh, yeah so this this fragmentation is actually beneficial for those organizations and hurts players it's a, a tough environment out here for players because they don't have the support that traditional employees do. And so I think this is a good time. Uh, somebody actually asked us to break down all of the different governing bodies and organizational structure in tennis. And I think this is a good time to do that. 
It is. And this petition from Shapatova puts into perspective two things. One, that perhaps tennis players themselves don't really understand these structures in mm-hmm. tennis like you just pointed out. And I mean, who could blame them? I had to, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. We had to do a lot of research to to get it. It's complicated. There are so many different bodies and interests at work here. This petition by Shapatova really puts into perspective what I think we can now assume that a lot of the players don't really know the intricacies and how the tennis setup really is. Yeah, so you ready to learn? (laughs) This might feel like a big tangent, but I get excited about stuff like this. I felt like this was a a big puzzle that I was trying to, to unlock here. So let's start with the governing bodies. So everyone has heard of the International Tennis Federation, the ITF, the ATP, and the WTA. So those three. The ITF is the world governing body of tennis. So what do they do? What is their purpose? They make and they enforce the rules of tennis on the international level. They regulate international team competitions like Davis Cup and Fed Cup. They sanction and govern Grand Slam events. But they're actually hosted and owned by the national federations in those four countries. So the ITF operates Davis Cup and Fed Cup. They organize the Grand Slam tournaments. They organize what's called the professional ITF circuit which is sort of the minor leagues of tennis. They've been operating both the men's and the women's ITF circuit since 1990. Most of the income of the ITF is from commercial revenue. That's media rights partnerships and sponsorships uh, from companies like BNP Paribas, ADECO, Rolex, and Uniqlo. They don't make a lot of money, right? Most of the net income, 80% of the net income, of the ITF is redistributed to the national organizations for player development, for for the development of the sport around the world. You say that they don't make a lot of money, but that 20% still constitutes a sizable chunk. Right. So, So of the net income, this is after everything else, after expenses, taxes, whatever, 80% of that net income is redistributed to the, the national federations. The rest of the 20% I would have to dig more. You know, we're not uh, financial analysts here, but we did look at the income statements and balance sheets. We had a lot of fun today, as you can <laughs> as you can see. So that's the ITF. The WTA and the ATP are nonprofit organizations that govern the respective men's and women's tours. They're uh, 501c6 organizations in the United States. They're tax exempt. They're both headquartered in Florida. They both have a board of directors. The board has an equal number of representatives for players and for tournaments. It's headed by a CEO. This is the same across both the WTA and the ATP, even though their structures are a little bit different. They each have a player council that sort of presents its wishes to the player representatives on the board of directors. And they both have a tournament council, which does the same for the tournament representatives on the board. Dave Haggerty also sits on the board as a federation representative. So ATP, the Association of Tennis Professionals, started as a players association way back in the 70s. They govern the ATP Tour, the Challenger Tour, the Champions Tour. They also run the Next Gen Finals, the Masters events, all the, I think there's 61 or 63 events on the ATP Tour. So they have a total revenue of 147 million. It's big, but it's not massive. Like this is not a billion dollar corporation here. 90% of that, more than 90% of that is from what's called program services. So that's from the fees they get from tournaments, their sponsorship agreements, and media partnerships, meaning like TV deals, streaming. And most of their assets are tied up in these events that they administer or other investments. Like they don't have a lot of free cash, right? They're not a publicly traded company. Most of the money they make is reinvested in the sport in some way. The WTA similarly governs the WTA Tour and its 55 events. Most of its revenue comes from sponsorship agreements, which are annual, TV rights, what they call tour operations fees, which is fees that the WTA receives for for basically operating the tour. Are you bored yet? Frankly, yes. (laughs) But, you know, it's good to know these things, right? So what we learn from this and from looking at 
the balance sheets is that, you know, the ATP has a lot more assets than the, the WTA, but neither has like a huge holding of non-current assets, of cash, of investments. Like this is, you know, max quarter million dollars at any at any one time. Mm-hmm. Where is this money going to come from? John Wertheim today tweeted that he's hearing a quote unquote tennis solidarity fund which seeks to compensate players outside the top 50 for loss of income uh, with the goal of $2,500 per week during this, quote, period of instability might be coming from tours and partners. Mm-hmm. That's that's vague. Like the $2,500 per month isn't vague, but the tours and partners, what does that entail? You are right in that the, the monies that the ATP and WTA may have on hand might not be as big a cushion as we might imagine it to be. Mm -hmm. And when we think of the folks who should be responsible for keeping these tennis players whole, we immediately think of the ATP and the WTA. But I I should hope that what your previous boring segment just (laughs) did was to let folks know that there's so many other people and entities that benefit from the labor of tennis players who should have a vested interest in keeping the streamline of talent coming right. on the other side of this. So let's talk about where the real money is. Okay, so first, we have the four national federations that run the Grand Slam tournaments. That's Tennis Australia, the FFT, the French Tennis Federation. You have the Lawn Tennis Association, which is Great Britain, Wimbledon, and the USTA. So they earn the vast majority of their revenue from the slams, they t- distribute this revenue all over the place to player development, to rec leagues, to programs, marketing, promotion, all these things. But the U.S. Open, for example, and Cincinnati are huge revenue drivers for the USTA. The Lawn Tennis Association in Great Britain, for example, earns 60 per- 63% of their annual income from Wimbledon. They earn a further 22% from the other major events, they call them, which are the other grass events in England. So that's like Queens, Birmingham, Eastbourne, Nottingham. And so I won't get into all this, but some of these associations are richer than others. The LTA is old. Wimbledon is extremely lucrative. They make a lot of money and they have a lot of money in equity. So they can afford to take care of their own. Right. I can see a path here where the French, the British, the Americans, the Australians they're able to take care of their pipeline. Right. But there's also... But then what happens to the Shapatavas of the world? Mm -hmm. If you're in Georgia... If you're ranked 300 and something as a Georgian tennis player. Exactly. If you're an African player, like... Do you then rely on the trickle-down effect from the ITF? Their redistribution of wealth, right? Right. Like, where do you go? Do you file for unemployment? I mean, this... To me, this is like... She's like, we're not making any income... We need to be paid by somebody, like we need help to sustain, and we're just casting a wide net here. The LTA, for its part, has introduced this uh, 20 million pound support fund. Uh, they just, the press release came out today, right? And so they they have a wide scope of control. There's local rec leagues, there's um, officials, coaches, players, and it's 20 million pounds, but I mean, that that money has to go pretty far, right? So they've introduced support grants for officials and coaches. They're trying to focus on the grassroots level rather than the professional level. So a lot of this money isn't going to players who you may know. They are supporting players ranked between 100 and 750, I think, who are not currently funded by the LTA. And they're doing things like provisions for mental health and well-being, home exercise kits they're sending to players, so they're they're doing something, but the LTA is an organization that has a lot of resources. And they've they've gotten those resources by circumstance, by the yeah, fact right, that they tradition. run Wimbledon. And, yeah, and I'm right? sure they run it well, but But this is the same issue that we run into now when folks were were kind of mad about the whole what was the the ATP Cup in Australia at the start of the year where mm. certain players got to play that event by virtue of well, having a partner from a certain country, right? that had a high-ranked player. And so that low-ranked player, by default, was able to make some cash. 
And some folks are saying that's not fair to other players from other countries who do not have, say, a top 50 ranked ATP player. Mm -hmm. This is the same kind of thing here. Right. You are lucky because you are British. You are lucky because you're American. While it might not be happening now and happening quickly, it's likely that there will be money coming to you at some point. But what happens to everybody else? World Team Tennis announced that they're going to be sending all of their players $1,000. So we've seen some movement, mm-hmm. be it what John Wertham's talking about, be it the LTA today, be it WTT. Stuff is starting to come together, but it's coming together separately. We're not, there's not one global fund within tennis to help folks here. Right. And so this puts into relief the just the absolute mess that is tennis governance, the fragmented nature of it, the way that it, I mean, it really helps mitigate risk for the people who invest in tennis, right? <laughs> they're not responsible for hundreds, thousands of players. They're responsible for, say, putting on a tournament or, you know, operating tournaments. But, but think about it this way. If we're to assume that, say, the top 50 players on either tour, they're fine. Right. Let's Say just... we assume that. Let's talk about 500 tennis players, which would then be ranking 50 to 2, ranking 50 to 300 on both tours, either tour, as a starting point. This is just an example. I would obviously hope and expect it to include more players. But if we're looking at taking care of 500 tennis players, we need, for four or five months, we need $5 million. And in the grand scheme of things, that's not a lot of money. $5 million divided by 500 is $10,000. If you give each tennis player $2,500 for four months or $2,000 for five months, that's where that $5 million come from. And that is a base point, I think. Surely, with all the many organizations and federations and corporations and folks who are billionaires who run tournaments, surely there is a way for them to come together to raise not just this $5 million, but say a $20 million fund to help tennis players through the end of the year. We've just told you how difficult it is because of how many different competing interests there are, but now we're here to tell you it shouldn't be that difficult. It's really a small amount of money in the grand scheme of things. Right, but let me continue our tour through through the structure of tennis. You, are you, are you, you saying did I was a of, bit premature? You did kind of stop me there. But I made a good so, point. Yes. So I was talking about, okay, so you get past the leagues, the, the ITF, etc. You get past the federations. Then you have the other interests at play in tennis. The people who invest in tennis. So that would be sponsors like uh, BNP Paribas, who runs Indian Wells, Rolex, who, you you know, you see their stuff at Wimbledon. They run the Shanghai Masters Tournament. All these different corporate sponsors who invest a lot of money in tennis, who help pay prize money, who, who put a lot of money in the sport in exchange for advertising and promotion and all this stuff and the association with a country club sport like tennis. Um, there's also... The companies that are vying for media rights in tennis, they pay a lot of money for the rights to Wimbledon. We've got BBC, ESPN, Eurosport, all these media companies. They're helping to fund tennis as well. There's streaming services. So ATP and the WTA sell their products to streaming services for to be in to tennis TV, to WTA TV. Yes, but you have to believe that those contracts are pretty much null and void at the moment with yes, no, t- no yes. tennis being So where I'm getting at, getting to is that I, I feel weird saying this, but I actually feel for the ATP and the WTA because from a lot of people's perspective, it's like, well, they need to support their players, but it seems like they're kind of left holding the bag. And I don't think that the ATP and WTA are actually that financially capable of supporting in the way that people feel that they should be. Whereas Rolex might be. These huge sponsors, these huge banks, BNP Paribas, they may have the capital, but in comparison to the ITF, WTA, ATP, like, those sponsors are the ones who actually have the money. Like, the tournaments are driving revenue for the leagues. And without the tournaments happening, 
those leagues don't have the cash to give out to players. I agree. And if you're a company like Rolex, where the Shanghai Masters may not be happening, and so you don't have to spend that money this year, perhaps you can use some of that money elsewhere. Right. And you, you may know, have maybe, more disposable income. Maybe their stocks are in the toilet. Their business is suffering during this period. They're not going to be spending it on tennis players. You know, but at the same time, like the WTA, I just don't, I don't think they really have the money. They've been struggling to put together a pension fund for former WTA players, you know? There's a huge opportunity here for somebody to make a big splash and garner so much goodwill. Perhaps somebody whose name has been run through the mud in the last few months, yeah. like Larry Ellison. I was going to say. With his Trumpian uh, contributions mm -hmm. and affinities. If you are a billionaire, that $20 million is Trump change. I mean, chump change. <laughs> it really is. And so you can use that $20 million. This is a conflict of interest that I will accept, mm -hmm. that I will embrace. Right. And so with so many people who have so much money in tennis outside of, say, like the federations and the governing mm -hmm. bodies. Yeah, like somebody they, whose name rhymes with John Miriak. <laughs> you know, that person could probably afford to throw some spare change. Sure can. And while I don't think it's the responsibility of the really rich players... I wouldn't be mad, nor do I not really think it incumbent on them <laughs> to help out in this situation. Well, the thing is, like, you... <sighs> okay. Because, no, no, I'm no, I'm going to sound listen, like listen. a communist here, but, like, you cannot rely on philanthropy to get us through these shocks and crises. Like, there needs to be an actual, basically, welfare state in place to support people when these huge crises happen. Sure. But these billionaires market to rich people, take their money... And they're all sitting in their private houses with their private pools, isolated and fine right now. And now the folks who are the ones who generate the money in tennis, who are the laborers in tennis, who are the future laborers in tennis, the future of the sport, they're the ones who are really struggling. Mm -hmm. And we understand that there are, are, there are degrees of struggle and disenfranchisement here. There are you know, are people who are risking their lives on the front lines of this crisis. There are people who are impoverished as a result of this crisis. I appreciate that disclaimer. Mm. But also, what I'm saying, there are those rich people, and then there are the tennis players who they themselves have become filthy rich off of tennis. There are folks out here who are very rich. These unnecessary mm. $4 million checks that Grand Slam winners get that they could do... A lot of good right mm. now. And I do think there's going to be a lot of movement on this front. Mm. We need to be most concerned with the well-being of these players and the future of the sport. And that's that's just the bottom line. Because we cannot have a sport that's so rich in so many ways, allowing so many players to potentially fall by the wayside and give up the game and imperil the future of the sport because there wasn't a will to action. Let's lighten things up a little bit. Shall we? Let's have a few laughs. We need some levity. Our listener Ben Bolzen suggested that we talk about player social media output, which you can imagine, with a lot of people bored and stuck at home, there is a lot of it. Yeah. I had tweeted out, can y'all give us ideas or suggestions as to what you want to listen to from us while we kind of... Just try and make the best of this situation content-wise. Because we're kind of, going forward, going to be having to make our own episodes. Right, like we have to be a little more creative. Yeah, which we enjoy. Uh, and so one of the things that Ben posited was this social media kind of reflection. Mm -hmm. There are other things that, we, that folks suggested that we will be doing. And I'll let you know at the end of this episode some of the things that are more immediate in the body that are in the, the pipeline yes mm. so social media i have been really into tiktok through this this these past three weeks of social <laughs> distancing i downloaded it i i told you at the beginning of this year i told you all that the body surf was going to get into some of these young people apps yeah well right? we gotta start doing stuff on video no i don't want i mean i don't Folks want to be on want, video 
I think folks want to see us. It's also a missed opportunity. Well, once they see us, they'll realize they don't want to see us. They want to see your new beard. <laughs> You've been growing a beard. Everybody. Everybody's growing a beard. But you didn't got one before. At, this is for the first true. time in but your life every, and times. Everybody's growing a beard these days in, in isolation. The point is, I'm, it's okay. a missed opportunity. Fine, it's a fine. missed opportunity. You need to get over your vanity. Like uh -huh. 90% of the time I see myself in photographs and videos and I'm like, wow, you is ugly as fuck. <laughs> and I don't think that's unique to me. <laughs> I feel like a lot of folks feel that way. Like not not everybody's out here being a model and shit. You know? Oh, I mean, on Zoom meetings at work, I'm looking in the camera and I'm like, oh god. Oh, so you can bring wow. that energy let to me, work. Let me put this computer uh, two inches higher, and I'm gonna look real good. You bring that same energy to our okay. TBS stuff okay. anyway, because it'll happen at the same kitchen table. Right. So I brought it up because I've been really into TikTok. Christy on has been really into TikTok lately. She's funny. Very funny. I didn't know all that was in there. She's In where? In, in her. In, uh, you weren't paying attention. <laughs> you weren't. I mean, okay, fine. Okay. We didn't know all that. But, you know, there's a lot of creativity there. Mm -hmm. She's very smart. Yes, and she's funny. She did something that upset some of the, I would say, more sensitive Novak fans. Hmm. It was a joke. I mean, it was, it was funny. Yeah. What did she do? Oh, she... Did a, a Mean Girls scene and then put like a, you know, I assigned big three people to each character in the scene. And she played all It's that, remember that, that three-way or four-way call in Mean Girls? Yes. Where they're talking shit about Gretchen or whoever. It's not that serious. Like, we've, we're dealing with like some really awful shit right now. It's nice just to laugh. I would like to point out that when you downloaded TikTok... For about a week, you're like, wow, this ain't shit. Yeah, but like, then... You said it was the most terrible thing ever. But then I think it's because you discovered Ali and so, his mom. Yes. So this Filipino-American guy and his mom, who have a TikTok together, he just thinks she's the funniest person on the planet. And that's why it works, because he finds her so genuinely amusing. Well, part of it is that he's laughing at her, which I don't always like, and it's kind mm. of exploitative. But I love that she's having so much she fun. She seems like she's having fun, right? And if you can't exploit your own mother, like, who else can you exploit? <laughs> right. But once once that algorithm started really hitting, you know, once they started generating videos that I really wanted to see, it was mm -hmm. like, wow, this, this app is great. They are legitimately hilarious. It's a good thing to do while, you, you know, some of you might be stuck inside alone. Some of you might be stuck with your parents or with a partner. It's... It's fun just to, to laugh and forget I feel like that was for a little while. So who else has been having a glow up on social media? So Venus Williams has been doing these daily workouts. And she's been on the on, more serious side On Instagram side of Live, yeah. She's been taking her followers through some easy home workouts. The best one, really, was it was scheduled. It was like, okay, everybody, at 12 o'clock on this day, I'm going to have my mom join my exercise regime. So Venus is holding two bottles of Prosecco as some, you know... She's making it very accessible. She's saying yeah. that if you have these bottles of liquor in your house, which we mostly all do. Right. <laughs> and so Venus is going through some exercises. And at the same time, her friend or assistant behind the camera is asking Oracine questions that people have submitted. Oracine is just... She's so wise. Like, God, Venus is so much like her. Right in the way that Oracine answers questions, it's at once poetic and withholding. <laughs> See, I totally disagree. Really, with how you are just framing it. Okay, okay. Venus is very wistful and aspirational and optimistic mm -hmm. in her embracing of cliched, <laughs> you know, uh -huh. lift me up kind of stuff. Whereas Oracine, you ask her anything that where Venus would take it well. I really look look at this and I, I think like, wow, you know, yeah. Orsine will just tell you her own life experience and present it as something that she was inspired by. <laughs> what do you think a woman... Okay, sure. Yeah. What do you think a woman should be? What do you think of a strong woman? Is there a strong woman that you look up to? And she just describes herself. Right, right. <laughs> in in Venus's uh, less generous moments, let's say, with the press, mm -hmm. they're Orsine-like. Yes. Right. And clearly, Oracine... I, sorry, I should say Miss Price. Mm -hmm. I don't know her like that. Miss Oracine 
is not somebody who grew up thinking she would have to answer these questions on an international scale. Her daughter, I mean, her daughters were raised through Instagram, to, right? Like her daughters were raised to think that you're going to be superstars, like you're going to be the greatest at what you do, maybe ever. But Miss Oracine, like she was just okay in my in my 30s or 40s, I was kind of thrust into this life, and she has handled it remarkably well. Her her advice to tennis parents, for example, like how do you handle having these two superstars as your daughters, and especially when they play each other. She's just like, well, I tell them to remember their sisters and that it's only a game. It's really that simple, right? And it clearly works for her because she is the most zen of all tennis parents. She's able to be clapping opponents, laughing when one of them falls on the on the court. <laughs> like, she is right? the epitome of goals yes. in many respects. Yes. So Venus's Instagram has been lit this past week. Serena made an appearance on Venus's Instagram and let me tell you, if that is not emblematic of why I would have a problem being Venus Williams, if I were Venus Williams, I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. is because it, is it because Serena is doing the absolute least uh, amount of work? <laughs> yeah, like Venus is here thinking about our physical and emotional health and well-being mm -hmm. in the time of COVID, mm -hmm. and Serena's out here putting cardboard cutouts. <laughs> Of herself. Pretending to be working So out. she can pass for being on the Zoom call. <laughs> the, well, the cardboard did have a wig. I'm just wondering, and it's clearly part of their shtick and their dynamic, but I can't see a situation where I would not be mad as hell many times mm -hmm. if I were Venus Williams. Because it's just like Venus is better than most of us. Yeah, that's, that's what it boils that's down the thing, to. Right? Serena is annoying. Stanley Wawrinka has been, I mean, as far as like professionalization of social media, Stanley is killing it. He's at the top as far as tennis is going. It is on fleek. Yes. It is first rate. And not only is the production value exceptional, the thirst value is exceptional mm -hmm. as well. I think he's still on the correct side of desperate. That's tenuous. Yes. But it's because the production level is so high and there's really an artistic vision in Stan's social media. I will take it. I will take it. <laughs> he did an homage to the opening credits of Dexter. I know people pushed back at me when I said this, but it was very clearly taking images from that that opening where Dexter is like cutting the blood orange and, and juicing the orange. Like that's obviously where he got it. Are you it was accusing quite... him of plagiarism? No, no. I was, I'm a accusing it's fair use i'm accusing him of um illusion mm. with an a my favorite to date two of them mm -hmm. garbinia muguruza this young woman this grown woman mm -hmm. really has got moves she can dance she's out here having victoria azarenka chase her own wig because she is what she aspires to be it <laughs> seems and she does it so effortlessly Garbinier is what was she doing? Gasolina is a Venezuelan woman. She knows how to move. It was Gasolina, she yes, did, right? Yes, and like swinging her head around, she could easily dirty wine. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. I'm sure of it. Mm -hmm. Tell him she's not been above appropriation in the past. That's something her and Vika have in common. <laughs> but that was, I mean, that was more like vacation braids. Okay. Vika, Vika has made a career of appropriation. She has appropriated so many cultures in just the last <laughs> week. <laughs> so shortly after Garbinia posted that video of her dancing skillfully to Gasolina, Vika did this uh, this TikTok meme of her like sp speaking a dialogue in Spanish, I think in a Puerto Rican accent. It was very weird. It was mimed. Yeah, yeah, it was weird. And she's done a lot of dance videos, which, you know, go ahead, girl. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. you do that. Yeah. But the thing is... I like... The thing is... No, like, but, no, but I the thing Vika. is... I do. You are able to get away with it if you're exceptional. Right? That's, yes. that's the Do you remember rub. what Cher that's said about rub. Miley Cyrus? I do. When she was, quote unquote, twerking? She said... That famous VMA performance. She said, it may have been different if it had been good. If it had been accurate or artistic or 
skillful twerking or head top dancing. But it wasn't. It just wasn't good. I think that Vika is better than that. She's made improvements. Yes. Oh, I agree. So to compare her no, but to it, Miley Cyrus here in that situation, how dare you? But, how <laughs> dare you? It was the idea that you presented of it would have it would be taken better if it had been performed. Why I presented that idea was to lift Ms. Muguruza up because mm-hmm. I enjoyed it that much. And then I also enjoyed Daria Gavrilova. Yes. <laughs> was it Pamela Pumpkin? What is Who it? Who is that? Pauline Pumpkin? What is that? I looked it up briefly. It's a vegan fitness instructor or something. Oh, okay. And so she's been doing these corona videos to help people work out at home. But Daria? These kids, man. You've got Gotta skills. Love them. You've got skills. These kids. Feliciano Lopez has been on Instagram Live for like days. There are these rumors that he's trying to get Andy on live. I don't speak Spanish, so I was trying to like desperately stay up. I had it streaming Is that what today. you were doing today? Yeah, did I you hear heard, I heard you from upstairs. <laughs> like, that is a lot of extended Spanish that, that you're listening to. That is a lot to. of Castellano. I was wondering if it was Rafa for a minute there. No, Feliciano was having fun. He was chatting with uh, Spanish journalist Rafael Plaza for a while. If you speak Spanish, you need to follow him because he's been doing the work. Mm-hmm. He's been getting a lot of Spanish-speaking players on his Instagram yeah, live. Yeah, And Rafa has been... Uh, doing a lot of promotion for this fundraising project for the Spanish Red Cross, Roja Cruz. And he's, the hashtag is Nuestra Mejor Victoria, Our Greatest Victory. Did I say that correctly? Si, yeah. Si, yeah. <laughs> but uh, Rafa's beard has attracted some attention, but God, the hair on the head top, man. Mm-mm. That is, this it's, is something that folks really have to accept It's upsetting. Point. You have to accept it. Mm-hmm. All right. So you, you asked for it, and that's what you got. Our take on players' social media. We are in the home stretch of this episode. Thank God. Everything, everyone is relieved. There have been many peaks and valleys. Emotional peaks and valleys. Serious stuff. Non-serious stuff. This one kind of encompasses both. The ongoing feud between Dominic Team and his former coach, Gunther Bresnik. Coaches. Yeah. Including Thomas Muster. I mean, that's kind of old news at this mm-hmm. point. That's ended. But now we have more Bresnik team mess mm-hmm. this week. Courtesy of German journalist Yannick Schneider. So allegedly... Do you want to do a very brief, dramatic reading? <laughs> sure, I'll be Bresnik. Okay. Speaking of the permanent break, the Fisher divorce. The schism? The divorce. Gunter Bresnik said, I have no problem with it besides the fact that I was misled. You can't do that to someone that you owe everything. His dad would be a club coach and Dominic a futures player without me. Team said, it's deplorable that he always blames my family and me in public for whatever reason after we worked successfully for so many years. The lesson here is that we we don't know the details of what happened between them, but the moral of the story is excise toxic men from your life whenever you have the opportunity. Well, we don't know what exactly happened. Dominic could have done sure. could have done him sure. dirty. He could have but, done him dirty. But two former coaches going to the press and talking all kinds of mess about you, that tells me you made the right decision in parting with them. Some would say that mm. you are the problem. I'm saying it could go either way. Yeah. The bottom line is, I think it's not a good look for anybody involved at this point. Right. Y'all just look small and petty. Anna Tadishvili announces her retirement from tennis. Anna won 11 singles titles and 8 doubles titles on the ITF circuit. She reached a career high of number 50. She's been mentioned on this show really because she was fined at the French Open for the first round performance rule. And eventually that was overturned. And it's because of injuries that she's now retiring at the age of 30. Because she can't see a way forward. Right. But she reached the fourth round at the 2012 US Open. That was her deepest round at a slam. She beat Karolina Pliskova at the 2015 US Open in the first round in 51 minutes. That was the year before Pliskova reached the final at the US Open. Tiago Zebos Vuj from Brazil, was really the first tennis player diagnosed with COVID-19. 
or at least the first to uh, to announce it publicly. This after he had a breakout early spring. Yeah, yeah. So the tennis circuit has been shuttered for the moment, and Zebosh is hopefully recovering well and quickly. So we wish him the absolute best. I think you may have even gotten that wrong. I think it's more Tiago Zaibush Vuj, oh, based on his own pronunciation oh, on the so ATP website. I know. Zaibush Vuj. That's what he said. Yes. Yes. And we're going to pronounce things like people want their pronou- their names pronounced. We're going to try. Yeah. At least. Or try to get as close as possible. I think those are those are like German names, but pronounced through Brazilian Portuguese. This news came out a couple of weeks ago, and hopefully he is on the mend or fully recovered by now. We haven't really heard much in the aftermath. Mm. So best wishes to Tiago. We're going to end the episode with a couple of things that we like and then let you know what you can expect from us in the upcoming weeks, which feel like months and years. Things that we like. A couple of days ago, I said to you, look, we're stuck at home. Should we buy a Disney Plus subscription? Or should we at least just do the free trial? We're going to at least pay for a month. We got we seven are. days free. We're going to pay for a oh, month I because... Mean, we looked at the library and we're like, I think uh, the we, the seven-day trial is enough. No, I think I, I, think I need the month because there's, there's other stuff I want to get into. It's <laughs> The nostalgia of it is incredible because I'm able to access all these cartoons in particular that I grew up with. And in particular... I've been enjoying TF, the fuck, out of Gummy Bears. Mm -hmm. Gummy Bears, bouncing here and there and everywhere. (laughs) Nobody asked for that. But the theme song does slap. It does. You know, it's not just a cartoon. It's, like, pretty smart in spots. Yeah, I mean, the gummy bears do drugs to make them act crazy and (laughs) bounce off trees and stuff. They drink their gummy bear Mm -hmm. juice. There's there's some like a post-colonial allegory with that human infiltrating the gummy bears and like they have to trust him, but you know he's gonna fuck them over. Very animal farm. <laughs> no, people really just just be bringing out Orwellian for any old thing. Don't <laughs> <laughs> Another thing that I like mm-hmm. this period of tennis uncertainty has made tennis players so much more accessible than they've ever been. We've seen folks giving us more of themselves on social media, and I'm all here for it. Make the most of it. If a tennis player is out here wanting you to interact with them, do it. Some of them are your heroes, like your legit heroes. When else will you have the opportunity? This is your chance. Shoot your shot. Marie Sharapova is giving people her phone number. And I'm going to (laughs) say, I'm going to issue a fuck you to you. What? For mocking her just now. I'm not. Like, no, no, no. There was, some sh- there was a tinge of shade there. I will not have it from you oh, or anybody wow. else. And you know what? Shame on all of you to put me in this position of defending Maria to this vociferous extent. But, no, but nobody is forcing you to do that. They are. Because Maria is out here being, to my mind, genuine. Mm-hmm. You know, calling... Doing a Twitter video saying, you know, I did a, a Zoom meeting with like 150 all last week and I really enjoyed it and it left me wanting more. So I've acquired this burner number. It'll come to my phone, my actual phone, but it's not my actual real telephone number. And we can text each other. I think that's amazing. Mm-hmm. And I don't think no, it is. it's an it's, opportunity it's cute. It for is folks cute. to be mocking her. No, I mean, it's not the number that Grigor calls, but it, like it's, you know, it is Maria Sharapova's phone number. Uh, wow. If if necessary, she will snap the phone in half and throw it in the garbage. If some of y'all get crazy. I just, for her sake, and I guess some of y'all will argue that it's deserved, but I, I just imagine there's so many Serena fans out there acting a fool right now with that <laughs> telephone number. And I would just caution you and implore you to just like, not do it. Not do it. Like, let folks, don't you have bigger fish to fry right like, now? Like, let folks have their fun. You know, like, there are, believe it or not, there are legitimate Maria Sharapova stands. And this is a big fucking deal for them. Let them have it. Mm-hmm. And now this is committed to body serve memory. 
You wanted to talk about quickly some of the things we have in the pipeline or or at least thought experiments. Yeah. I mean, I was going to allude to some of them rather than come out and oh. tell you exactly. Oh, okay. Well, you put it, you put it no, in writing. I'm so. absolutely going to tell you what they are because with so little content being produced by actual tennis, and by that I mean none, folks are out here having to scramble. Mm. Tennis Channel has all this stuff that they have to do to keep people poning up that yeah. subscription money. So like, And so I fear that some of the stuff that I'm spending hours on producing from the Body Serve Studios in Toronto oh, wait, will get... It's going to be scooped? Usurped by Tennis Channel and all other folks, one of which happened today. Mm. Because we've done these retrospectives. Well, we did one. We did Monica Sellis, and it seems to have been pretty well received. And so that was one of the main things that we were going to do in these next few months And it dovetails with book reports and whatnot. If there was somebody that warranted a full deep dive, we do that. We still need to reach out to folks from the GoFundMe who donated $100 or more. You're entitled to request a retired player and we'll do a book report. Mm. Some folks will require a deep dive. Some folks will just be like, maybe we'll do two or three players in one show. But I can tell you that the player... No, you cannot. Why not? (laughs) We're working. I just explained to you why no. I want to do it. And no, we're working on an episode about a particular player. And uh, no, I don't want you to spoil it because I don't want to get scooped. But I want folks to know that we were working on it if we do well, get scooped. We, we can tell them that. They'll trust us. <sighs> the thing is, I've, I've said from a while back that there, there's still a lot to report. There's still a lot of stuff to talk about while tennis is on hiatus. We have to be creative and we're going to do that. So you're telling me I can't say specifically about anything that no, we're working on? No. I, well, I will say that... So last last year we did an episode about the kind of the pre-open era of tennis. And what we'd like to do soon is uh, kind of a sequel to that episode and talk about the early years of open professionalized tennis because it was like the Wild West. So that's something that we're working on. We're working on a deep dive about a particular player and really like any player who we do research on and feel that it speaks to something bigger, we're going to pursue it. We're also doing an episode on a rivalry, one that I grew up with. We are. I'm going to have to like bring you along on that one as well, it seems, but it is worth doing and we will do it. So that's that. That's that's Body Serve 192. Thanks for listening. You can find us at the body serve on Twitter and Instagram. Um, I'm James. I'm at Elliot JMR. Two L's, two T's. I'm Jonathan at tennis underscore John. Uh, take care of yourselves. Stay away from other people. And um, I hope that we have been some comfort in some way through these trying tennis times and real times. That's what we hope this episode mm-hmm. was. A port in the storm. In some way, in some small way. Till next time. Thank you. Thank you very much.